Okay, so uh, so this talk uh, is going to be a bit more, I guess, more practical comparing to the previous talk, which is actually quite interesting. And uh, and what I'm going to talk now is about uh, scalability of core concurrency primitives. So we 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 know that it's quite easy to write concurrent programs in Go, uh, but Sometimes there are so, and and there are not actually so many uh, uh, primitives, so many uh, construct language constructs that you need to use to write concurrent programs, such as Go routines, channels, and some uh, library uh, types and functions like mutuses and uh, atomic uh, functions. Uh, but still, it could be confusing whether you should use them, whether you shouldn't use them, which one to use, uh, in which case, and. Uh, and during this talk, I basically will try to show you some of the use cases and how they perform and uh, maybe give some practical advice as well. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, why do we want to write concurrent programs in the first place? And uh, actually, it's a very good question because it's not very easy to write concurrent programs. You need to deal with race conditions. You need to think how the data flows from one thread to another thread. and uh, uh, so many things that you need to think about comparing to single-threaded programming. In fact, many uh, languages and frameworks are single-threaded, like Node.js or Emacs. Or, uh, even Python, it has some <coughs> global block inside the interpreter that makes writing concurrent programs easier, but uh, they don't really scale. Uh, so, why do we want to write concurrent programs? That's the question. And uh, I basically copied here a slide from another Go presentation, and uh, there is a link to the talk uh, by Rob Pike, that, uh, who, uh, who is one of the creators of Go language, and who talks about uh, the difference between concurrency and parallelism. And uh, well, basically, <coughs> concurrency enables parallelism, and what parallelism gives you is that it can make your program faster because your program can suddenly uh, take advantage of multiple CPU cores that uh, current modern machines have and uh, instead of running in one thread, it could run in 10 threads, 20, 40 threads and could be like even 40 times faster just because it uses concurrency. But it's important to understand that not every program can be made faster. Uh, and uh, I basically want to uh, show uh, say word warning before going further um, and describing uh, uh, and, and talking more about concurrency primitives is that uh, even though I will show some micro benchmarks that show certain numbers and some are good, some are not so good, I think when you start program you shouldn't really think too much about these numbers because basically the correct code is always better than fast code and incorrect code. So, if your code is clean, it's easier to understand, easy to reason about. Uh, maybe you can make something much, much faster, or maybe you can make something 100 times faster, but if it only takes 1% of your uh, running time of your application, it probably won't matter. So, I think the clean code should be uh, the first principle that you should follow in the programs. Uh, the second uh, principle is that even though I will show certain benchmarks, they will certainly not apply to all programs. So if you benchmark something, and I will show a few uh, ways to benchmark all programs, you should always benchmark your program. And ideally, you should also benchmark it under the realistic load on the realistic hardware. Otherwise, you might find that on your laptop, the program is fast, and that you would expect that the server class machine it would be faster, but it won't be faster because of some other problem. So, um, yeah, that's just a general advice before I carry on. And I will, uh, through this talk, I will just show a few examples, and I will show you how to use and how to not use Go uh, uh, to, to solve them. So. Uh, the first problem is very, very simple. So we have a CSV file with the weather information, time, city, temperature, and basically just want to put this data into a database, the PostgreSQL database. Uh, very simple um, table with three columns. Uh, 
about how, how would you do it? Go and well, basically Go makes writing concurrent programs very, very easy. So let's let's make a concurrent program to uh, put this CC file into a database and I kind of remove <coughs> non-essential parts like uh, connecting to database and then basically that's uh, the whole problem. You prepare a, a statement, SQL statement, to insert data into the table um, and then you basically read the file line by line <coughs> using scanner um, and uh, for each line you run a new go <coughs> basically handles the line and using a uh, sync weight group uh, type it basically makes sure that at the end of the program you will wait until all, go all go routines finished uh, so each line by for each line you add uh, one you increment counter inside weight group and when the line is handled by GoRoutine, you decrement it, and uh, at the end of the application, just wait uh, for uh, this counter to become zero. And the handle line is actually very simple. You basically just split the line into tokens and uh, execute the prepared statement by passing these three parameters. And, well, basically, quite simple. I guess it will take maybe five minutes to write, but uh, let's let's test it. And uh, I basically will try to demo it actually on the real machine. So I have here an AWA, uh, AWS EC2 instance, uh, which is quite powerful machine with 36 uh, CPU cores and 60 gig of memory. Uh, so <laughs> it's a perfect machine for uh, demo scalability. Don't forget to shut it down. Uh, it's a spot instance. It's really cheap. <laughs> okay, okay. You can rent spot instance like for 50 cents per hour. Mm -hmm. It's really, really cheap. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so basically, I have here um, a bit of shell magic that uh, would launch this program with. Yes, <laughs> with different uh, values of, of uh, Go max prox variable, which um, which is basically uh, tells Go runtime how many operating th system threads to use to run this program, and I will run it. And well, basically, when it finishes, it will show you this nice table. It shows the number of. Uh, Thread and the time that it took uh, to run this program, and well, I spare you waiting for this to finish because it takes forever. And on the next slide, I will actually show you the running time. Well, it takes about four minutes uh, to finish, and it doesn't scale at all. As you can see, no matter which value of Comax Prox I set, uh, the running time is exactly the same. It's about four minutes. Actually, it grows up. Uh, so, uh, what's wrong with it? Well, there, they, in this particular case, the approach is wrong. You shouldn't insert a large file in such parallel way. Instead, this is another problem that does exactly the same, and uh, but in slightly different way. So basically, it uses, in this particular case, uh, some PostgreSQL specific functionality that allows you basically to the bulk insert data and this uh, copy in so unfortunately it goes um, SQL package it doesn't provide any database and dependent way to insert data to, to execute like batched statements but um, the drivers they are free to provide some uh, optimized way to insert statements and, uh, and, and insert data and basically what it does it starts the transactions transaction it prepares a statement using this copy in <laughs> function from uh, a <coughs> driver package and then it handles lines exactly the same handle line function and at the end it executes uh, empty uh, like exactly the empty uh, with no parameters basically to uh, tell uh, this copy in 
prepared statements that uh, all the data is there and commits transaction. And uh, well, basically, let's run it. <laughs> you can already see from the next slide that it takes only two seconds to run. Didn't press Control C enough times here, but uh, yeah, that basically it uh, it takes less than two seconds to run to insert one million records and here's the command to prove <coughs> that there are uh, one million records uh, in the database and uh, so basically the single threaded uh, program it runs <laughs> 200 times faster than multi-threaded programs just because uh, there is no overhead of concurrency and uh, obviously uh, when you deal with large data it's better to deal with this data in batches rather than in single uh, rows. And um, I'll, I'll go to the next example and uh, here we will try to write a program that uh, calculates number pi uh, using Monte Carlo method. And well, the, uh, the idea of Monte Carlo method is uh, that you basically generate a huge number of random values and then you see what is the percentage of what's the ratio of these values to satisfy certain criteria and then uh, based on the ratio of, uh, you can find out the answer basically. Uh, and in this particular case we, will, we are going to generate uh, random points in this square like top uh, top right quarter and we will count number of uh, points that belong to this uh, uh, quarter over circle and uh, basically w once we found this ratio we can uh, multiply it by 4 and get number py uh, pi. Uh, it's a very simple uh, program, you can just generate uh, many random points you see uh, using this very simple expression whether it it's uh, inside the circle, if it's inside the circle, increment counter, return, and then uh, basically run uh, this function in multiple coroutines. Uh, I'll choose a um, number of cores as the number of coroutines to run. It doesn't really matter, it makes sense to run more. So you won't be able to uh, uh, use <laughs> more CPU cores than you have on your machine. And what it does basically creates a channel uh, for the results. Uh, launches a Monte Carlo method uh, course times, and then it basically knows that the number of uh, records, uh, the number of uh, results in this channel is going to be course. So it basically collects all of them and then uh, prints the final result. And uh, here's again bit of shell magic to run it uh, and see the results. Again, um, it actually takes quite long, so I will just show you the results. And you can actually see that it's negatively scaled. <laughs> it's really fast with one thread, about eight seconds, but then suddenly it becomes much slower. And with 64 cores, it takes 60 seconds, basically. Uh, eight times slower than with one core, and um, it's actually quite surprising. So let's try to figure out <laughs> what happened. <laughs> yes, so, um, and uh, before doing that, I will uh, talk about uh, this uh, interesting feature in a Go testing package. I guess not many people know about, but uh, it's quite useful sometimes. It's called parallel benchmarks. And this is an excerpt from uh, Go uh, documentation. So basically, usually when you run benchmark function, you just run it for n times in the cycle. But uh, to run parallel benchmark, uh, you use run parallel function, listing the p, uh, and run it until the benchmark, until the testing framework tells you that it's no longer need to run. And uh, the interesting thing, so uh, if you remember the previous slides, I showed how to run uh, the same program with different values of uh, GoMax Prox values, but the Go testing framework can do it for you. And 
this is the simple uh, command indication of test uh, or test that uh, will run the same benchmark with different values of Womax box and sh uh, um, show you the result. And uh, here is the example of um, using this uh, uh, run parallel function. And uh, in this particular case, I basically want to benchmark how well run float64 function scales uh, when it's a a executed uh, using different number of threads. And I haven't finished yet. <laughs> It's low. And so basically, I just uh, run it, and as you can see, it will show you the the results here. And uh, this number here, it basically shows you the number of uh, Gomax procs, and uh, this number here shows the uh, how, how how fast the operation is. And I should say that for the scalable program, this number should actually decrease, and uh, it's kind of quite easy to understand why, because for example, if um, I, don't know, I can eat five durians per hour, it means that I can eat uh, one durian 12 minutes, but if I invite my friend and he can eat only 10 durians per hour, then basically I require only six minutes to eat, we both require only six <coughs> minutes to eat durians. So basically, it's the same uh, analogy applies here, the number should decrease, but um, with uh, run to uh, float 64, you can see that actually it increases. It's not very linear, sometimes like a certain value, it's uh, the largest is for eight threads, and then it kind of decreases a little bit, so. But it certainly doesn't scale. It's actually fastest with a single thread. Uh, and uh, why it doesn't scale? Because uh, float 64 is a thread safe uh, function, and it uses mutex internally uh, to protect its internal state from con concurrent modifications from braces. And uh, you can find all these documentations in the Godoc. The default source is safe for concurrent use by multiple coroutines. Uh, the one way of doing it, of making it uh, safe, is to use mutex. And, um, well, if you check the source code, it does use mutex, and you can see that mutex doesn't scale, but it's interesting thing that uh, later we'll see that actually when the, there is no contention, the mutex is actually very fast. I talk here about nanoseconds of information. So, uh, and basically, uh, let's, let's try to make this random number generation concurrent. And I will kind of show a few different approaches and we'll see whether they scale or not. Uh, the first approach, let's use channel. So basically we will launch a separate coroutine that will populate channel with random values. The channel is buffered, 1,000 uh, elements. <coughs> and uh, just to get random number, we just read from channel. We can run it uh, using the same command just different benchmark name. Let's see how it performs. Uh, and um, actually we can see that the single threaded case is actually slower. And then we can see it doesn't scale at all as well. And I guess it probably even performs worse with a bigger number of threads. Uh, and and, uh, and basically, why is that? Well, the channel internally, it uses mutex or well, some sort of similar uh, concurrent construct. And uh, channel is very generic, uh, multi-consumer, multi-producer data structure. It cannot be very efficient. It's, it's flexible, it's easy to use, but if you need to, like, to pump lots of data through it, and like, <coughs> if you need to run uh, many, many operations per second, it's probably not the best data structure to use. But on the other hand, <coughs> if the operations that uh, you need to do using channel, for example, are relatively expensive comparing to the channel uh, uh, overhead, then it's a perfectly fine data structure to distribute work and so on. Uh, 
Okay, so um, what about other approaches? Uh, well, actually, in other languages, like Java, for example, uh, the random uh, object is also thread safe, and uh, but they provide a different uh, class called thread local random that basically scales much much better because it keeps its state in the thread local uh, area and uh, uh, basically each thread operates on its own uh, data structure so they all, all threads they're independent but there is no thread local state is uh, no thread local uh, array in Go uh, and will never be but can you use something else from uh, concurrent from a standard library of Go to maybe emulate similar idea and it, it turns out that yes we can uh, we can use sync pool uh, to do something very similar to thread local effectively we will uh, create a sync pool and, and what sync pool is sync pool is like an object pool that uh, allows you to pull a few instances of um, certain objects and then as garbage collection runs then these objects can be released <coughs> if uh, there are too many too too much memory used uh, but if the amount of memory is not um, it, there are lots of free memory then they they won't be released basically and uh, in order to use sync pool you just need to provide a function uh, that uh, creates a new object it's like a factory function and then what you do to use it, you basically get an object from thread pool. You run uh, the functionality and then you put it back. So basically you reuse, in this particular case, what we do, we reuse these uh, run instances, which are non-thread safe, by the way, because this is not global run instance. This is just a, a new run instance that uh, is created using you. Uh, but because we basically get it from pool and then put it back, they are thread safe to use in this particular way. And if you run benchmark uh, using this uh, parallel benchmark, then we will see that uh, kind of finally we can see that something scales. So with two threads, it's actually two times faster. Then uh, with one thread, and suddenly it becomes slower, and suddenly it becomes much faster. With 16 threads, <coughs> and kind of um, much, much faster. And so it kind of scales, but not very regularly. <laughs> uh, and uh, if I run the same command again, we'll see completely different numbers. So it's basically fairly random, but it's much, much better than the channel already. Uh, And then this basically leads us to the most optimal way of uh, doing this particular problem. It's basically we shouldn't share any mutable state between Go routines. And instead of trying to use some like sync pool or global random function channel, uh, we would just basically create a random uh, object uh, per Go routine. So this completely, these core routines, they become completely independent. They don't share any state, they don't communicate. And actually, the code is very simple, much simpler than everything else, apart from probably the global one. And let's see how it performs. As you can see, numbers 13 becomes very, very fast. It scales all the way early. <coughs> Once we increment, once we double number of CPU cores, uh, it becomes faster. And actually, we can see that it, like roughly up to 16 cores, it scales up linearly, and then it kind of slows down, and then doesn't scale for 64 uh, threads. And um, I guess because this is a 36 core box, and probably because of hyperthreading, it doesn't really scale up to 36 times, but. Uh, it scales pretty well, uh, and basically with the 16 uh, cores you get roughly 16 times faster program and actually uh, the final program uh, that 
uh, implemented using this uh, idea of non-sharing state. Uh, let's see how fast it works. And then basically we'll see that even for single thread it's faster because there is no overhead of synchronization. Actually, it runs much, much, much faster uh, using multiple threads. So basically by using more threads, we managed to make this program, yes, about 20, 16 times faster. And that's the whole idea of parallelism, that you make things faster by using multiple cores. This is just a chart. And um, another, uh, the last example that I want to show is about maps. And uh, I guess many people know that maps are not safe for concurrent use. Actually, I should here. <laughs> so, so, so uh, imagine that we have uh, uh, this map of strings, with the string keys and string values, and uh, we basically want to read it very often. And this map is either immutable, so basically just read on the startup or, or maybe changes but very infrequently and, and basically we want to write something that does it in the best possible, <coughs> best scalable way uh, and uh, yeah, as I already started to talk about uh, threat safety of the map of the maps uh, they're actually safe for use uh, for, for read from multiple threads so as long as you create a map and then all the go routines that read this map kind of they happen after this the last write it's perfectly fine to, to read the map from multiple threads so if you have load configuration and then read uh, from uh, multiple go routines it's, it's perfectly fine as long as you don't modify this map concurrently and here is uh, just basically a simple example uh, also written as a benchmark that shows this pattern. So basically we, we launch, uh, uh, we, we create a map, uh, we populate it with some values, <coughs> uh, 100 values, and then again using run parallel we run multiple go routines that would read from this map, just one read uh, for execution of this four cycle. And uh, we, I will use this benchmark uh, to basically demo uh, the scalability of certain uh, of certain uh, go, um, <coughs> concurrency primitives, and yeah, if we run this uh, benchmark with race, we will see that there are more races, uh, and uh, it works pretty fast. And you can see that it scales based on this number. So basically, roughly, is that uh, increase in a uh, number of uh, CPUs, uh, the time to co to complete the operation roughly becomes twice smaller. Uh, what about writes? And basically this benchmark is very similar to the previous benchmark but in addition to reading uh, map from multiple go routines, I run another go routine that would modify the map every 100 milliseconds. And Uh, it's not safe. Uh, we can even run it without race and with Go 1.6 it will panic because uh, Go 1.6 it actually can connect, uh, uh, that can uh, detect the concurrent writes to a map and it will basically just panic so the error is seen earlier even without race detector. We will not run it but it panics. Uh, so the first approach is to use mutex to protect uh, the access to this map and basically uh, this program is very similar to the previous one but just we add lock and unlock uh, for the modification and we add lock and unlock for read and it's important we need to protect both read and write operations with the mutex uh, and again we run benchmarks <coughs> and we see that it doesn't scale very similarly to uh, global runt source um, just because it's in uh, but I should say well unless we are talking about like uh, hundred thousand operations per second it doesn't really matter much I mean mutex 
will work in most uh, non-contented uh, uh, scenarios because as we saw in the previous benchmarks the overhead of mutex is very very small in non-contented case it's only 20 nanoseconds uh, so if you know that you're not gonna access your map concurrently very very often it's perfectly fine to use mutex but let's see if you can improve this uh, scalability of this greedy operation and one uh, uh, one structure that can help us is read write mutex also from the standard sync library uh, and this write function is exactly the same as the previous one but uh, the difference here that for read operation we use special special methods uh, read lock and write uh, read r lock and r unlock which would basically block on the writer but they will allow concurrent reads uh, and let's see what are the results the results actually much better with the mutex but still you can see that this scaling is not so good even though we just use read lock most of the time this data structure inherently is not super scalable it scales a little bit but it's not super scalable and the reason for that and actually it's very general principle for any scalability programs if you have mutable shared state then the things won't scale and what is mutable shared state in read write mutex in fact, if you check the source code, you'll find out that it tracks the number of readers internally. So every time you run this R lock operation, uh, it will basically increment this number and decrement on R unlock. And so basically, you have a shared mutable state event on read locks. And you can see it kind of becomes a bit faster, but it's still not linear scaling. Uh, And finally, it's a bit uh, maybe over optimization in almost all cases, but um, I still think it's quite interesting to know about uh, this approach. Is basically use copy and write <coughs> and, uh, something called atomic uh, dot value <coughs> standard library. And the idea of atomic value is that uh, it basically provides you two operations. One is store, and the second one is load. The store will store value on this uh, atomic value and load will load previously stored value and it's all done in a thread safe way so there are no races between store and load uh, and uh, if you look at the coroutine that modifies this map uh, what it does basically instead of modifying this map in place it will get uh, the load it will load this uh, uh, map from the atomic value. It will clone it, so basically just copy all keys and all values to a new map. Uh, it will modify it, and then it will store it back. And uh, the read uh, goroutine, it will basically load it to a local variable, and then read from it. And so uh, no synchronization is necessary because basically this load it will never see like partial writes or the write goroutine. Uh, it will always see the, the, the final map, either the previous one or the new replaced one. And well, it's kind of important to know that this is safe because we have only one single writer goroutine. But if you have like multiple goroutines, it's no longer safe because you can accidentally basically skip updates and um, if you have multiple writers, you would use mutex but just for writing or maybe channel to queue all the updates. Uh, and, and, and this approach generates garbage, so basically it creates a map on each uh, clone, uh, on each update. It will create a new instance of the map, it will completely copy all the keys from one uh, and all the values from one map to another. Uh, but uh, let's see how it performs and actually it scales <laughs> so we, we can see that it's almost as fast as uh, reading without any blocks and any synchronization uh, 
But as I mentioned, it's very rarely that you need to use this approach. But it's good to know that it exists, and it's good to know the general principle that if there is no sharing, there's no mutable state shared, then uh, these things can scale. And if there's something shared, it doesn't scale. And again, there's no reason to, as we saw from the first uh, example, we post uh, the, the database. There's no reason to split your work in two small pieces and run them concurrently. It's better to patch things almost all cases. Uh, well, basically, it. Uh, that's all I wanted to say today. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Go back to the first question where you read the CSV file with the coroutines. Where it comes up, the single core is fast. It's the fastest one. I think just this one. Yeah. I, I still don't understand why it's, uh, um, why it's not uh, like scaling on the multiple processors. Okay, so uh, let's let's think what happens underneath uh, when you run one line, one <coughs> routine per, per uh, line. First of all, uh, even the Go routines are quite fast, and then we create one million here of them. One million is a lot of Go routines, so there will be some <coughs> scheduling overhead, and there are lots of garbage collect created because you need to uh, hold all these like variables somewhere in the heap and. It use, the, this program uses actually a lot of memory. I didn't show it, but it does use a few gigabytes of memory for one million uh, line CSV file. Uh, that's uh, the first thing. So the, this overhead of synchronization. But the second thing is actually this program it needs to do uh, the round trip to the database for each line. So basically, instead of like sending all the data on the like TPAP connection without receiving any, or maybe just a few, uh, like acts, it should like send one line, receive acts, and another line, receive acts, and another line. And it's just, it's just much, much, much more, more work to do for the database, for this program, uh, for the computer, <laughs> basically, itself. So even though this program <laughs> looks very simple, underneath, it does a lot of work. That's that's the whole reason why it is so slow. It's basically 20 times slower than uh, the patched version. And the patched version, on the other hand, it doesn't even load the CSV file in memory. It basically reads it, and as soon as it reads it, it sends it to database. It doesn't even hold this file in memory. It's just a more efficient way of doing it. Any more questions? If not, then uh, thanks, Abbasan, for the presentations. Uh, yeah. The next talk will be uh, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs>